Kenneth Eskine embarked on a reign of terror, killing several elderly people in 1986 in London. In this video, I will tell you the entire story. I'll go through all the murders and then give you my own opinion on why I think he did and I think it started when he was a child, but I'll get to that later. If you do end up liking this video, please subscribe. Before we continue, I'm going to keep it real with you. There's something going on with YouTube. A lot of other creators are having problems getting ads on their videos. So if you do want to help support my channel, I have started a membership offer. There's no perks. I don't want my videos behind a paywall. I genuinely don't. So if you want to help support, please join. And if you don't, it's okay. No problem. Thank you for your consideration anyway. The London Borough of Stockwell in South London is a favoured place for elderly folk to retire to. In the summer months of 1986, however, a serial killer known as the Stockwell Strangler began a reign of terror amongst this community, leaving seven people dead and a further four suspected of being victims of him. Now, the murders started with the death of 78-year-old Nancy Ems. She was found dead in her unkempt basement flat on the 9th of April 1986 in Wandsworth, London. At first, the cause of death was thought to be of natural causes as Nancy was found lying in her bed with no obvious marks on her body. Now, a doctor was called to the scene and assumed she had been dead for three days, so he assigned her a death certificate, claiming the death was of natural causes. It was only until later where those who found the body noticed that a portable TV set was missing, so the police were called in. A post-mortem revealed that Nancy had been strangled by bare hands. There was also heavy bruising to her chest, suggesting that her killer had kneeled on her whilst he throttled her. Now the killer left no signs of a breaking, but there was a left for the police. They found what was known as an Afro-Caribbean hair strand on the floor. On the 9th of June 1986, the body of 67-year-old widow Mrs. Janet Cockett was found in her flat on the Overton Estate in Stockwell. Detectives were immediately aware that this was a murder they were dealing with. Mrs. Cockett had been savagely sexually assaulted and had two fractured ribs as a result of someone kneeling on her chest. Her nightdress had been ripped from her and it was folded neatly and then put on her bed. And then the police noticed something bizarre. The family photos on the bedside and on the wardrobe and around the room were all put face down. The police also discovered a clear palm print at the scene. Pathologist Dr. Ian West examined the victims and determined that they were all strangled by the killer using only one hand. In such elderly victims, unconsciousness would have occurred within 30 seconds and death within two or three minutes. Detectives working the both murders compared the notes on the different crimes. But at this moment, they didn't see a link. They couldn't see a pattern emerging. So they just left it at that as two separate crimes. In the early hours on the 27th of June, 1986, Retired engineer Fred Prentice was asleep in his room in a council-run old people's home in Cedars Road in Clapham when he was awoken by a noise in the corridor outside his room. Mr. Prentice saw a young man enter his room but managed to put on the bedside light as the intruder jumped on him. Now Mr. Prentice was trying to shout out but the young man put his hands on his lips and told him to shh. He then squeezed his windpipe powerfully and then relaxed his grip and then squeezed it again. And as he kept squeezing, the young man kept saying, kill, kill, kill. Mr. Prentice was able to hit the alarm button that he had on the side of his bed. And though nobody came, it did alert the young man who was strangling him and the young man got off him and then escaped. Detectives were now optimistic that the crimes were linked and any remaining doubts that they did have were dispelled the next night as the killer struck again. The bodies of 84-year-old Valentine Gilem and 95-year-old Polish-born Bigniew Strabowska were found in their adjoining rooms on the 28th of June 1986. Now I know I butchered those two names, but it is what it is. Also keep in mind, these two were found in an old folks home. So slowly you're seeing a pattern now. This guy had a thing for the elderly. 
Both men had been manually strangled and sexually assaulted. The intruder had been spotted by alert night duty staff but had vanished before police arrived. The entrance was once again to be determined as an open window. What made this horrific crime even more chilling was the discovery of a used flannel and electric shaver the killer had calmly washed and shaved after killing two people in a nearby room. This may be far-fetched but so far we're learning the killer liked it neat and tidy right like when he killed the elderly woman he tidied up folded her clothes put it on the bed in this case he shaved and smartened himself up perhaps this was a ritual for him detective chief superintendent ken thompson of scotland yard was now put in charge of the case and was given a squad of over 200 detectives to try to find the man the newspapers had now dubbed the Stockwell Strangler. Now two weeks after the previous double murder, the Stockwell Strangler struck again. And he managed to deceive detectives by strangling on the other side of London in Islington by the River Thames. 82 year old widower William Carmen was found dead in his bed in his flat on the Marquis estate. And yet again, the bed sheet was neatly pulled up under his chin. And for the first time since the first murder, there were clear signs of theft. £400 to £500 of Mr. Carmen's savings were missing and there were clear signs of ransacking. Now on the 20th of July 1986, the body of 74-year-old William Downs was found in his flat on the Overton estate in Stockwell. He had been strangled in now familiar fashion and police were able to pick up on a new lead they got from the murder scene. From the garden gate and the kitchen wall, they now had a clear fingerprint of the killer. One would think that it would be a formality to match the prints with the ones already on file at Scotland Yard. But in 1986, although fingerprints had already been transferred onto computer disk, the process of transferring palm prints had not even begun. Detectives had a staggering 4 million files to work through. But by concentrating on London-based burglars and petty crooks, they were able to reduce this job to a more manageable size. Three months going through these files ciphering through day and night the police were able to find a match they matched it to kenneth erskine who to them was a long time crook who previously had been caught for burglary however police did not know where to find erskine and it was whilst they were searching for him that he killed his final victim 80 year old florence tisdale was found in her upmarket apartment at ranley gardens close to putney bridge on the 24th of July 1986, she had spent the previous day watching the televised wedding of the Duke of Duchess and had even had her hair done specially for the event. She was found the next day manually strangled, sexually assaulted with broken ribs where the killer had kneeled on her chest. Now the problem the police had was that Erskine was a drifter. He had no permanent address. They were reduced to searching through the hundreds of squats and hostels in South London. The fact that Erskine was on a killing spree and could kill again at any time made them move quickly. Their big break came when they discovered that Erskine was claiming unemployment benefit from a Department of Social Security office in Southwark and was due to collect his next check on the 28th of July, again all in 1986. A team of detectives kept watch on the building and Erskine turned up right on time to collect his check. As he joined the queue, detectives ran, clicked the handcuffs onto his wrist and there, Erskine was caught. It was when detectives began to question Erskine that they realised they had an uphill struggle on their hands. Erskine spent the majority of his many hours of questioning, giggling, staring out the window into the sky or masturbating. He was clearly a disturbed individual, but was not a complete fool. In his possession, detectives found details of 10 different bank accounts and building society accounts that Erskine had opened to hide the proceeds of his burglaries. Detectives noted that he had paid in nearly 3,000 during his killing spree while still drawing unemployment benefit. The palm prints were damning evidence, but they only placed Erskine at two of the murder scenes. And with Erskine refusing to talk, detectives searched for another evidence. Now Fred Prentice, who earlier was the one who hit the alarm when Erskine attacked him, willingly attended an identity parade at Clapham Police Station. He managed to pick Erskine out from the line of criminals. 
Scotland Yard also took the unusual step of issuing his picture to the media in an attempt to find more witnesses. The response brought in several leads, including a woman who saw Erskine on Putney Bridge 200 yards from the scene of the final murder on the night in question. Erskine's trial started at the Old Bailey on the 12th of January 1988, where he was charged with seven murders and the attempted murder of Mr. Prentice. Erskine pleaded not guilty to all the charges, but looked around the courtroom vacantly as though he was unaware of where he was. The jury was visibly moved while listening to the evidence, particularly in the case of Mr. Prentice's testimony. After a trial lasting 18 days, Erskine was convicted of all charges and was jailed for seven life terms, with the minimum term of 40 years to be served. Police believe that Erskine may have killed before his first known victim, and police theorised that due to the frailty and age of the choice of Erskine's victims and the lack of obvious injuries, many may have been attributed to natural causes. It remains a frightening thought that Erskine may have killed more. Now Erskine himself was born to an English mother and an Antiguan father and he was raised in Putney in London. He was one of four sons, they said he was quite a fat kid but he was very much into his bible reading. Erskine soon became difficult to control and he was sent to schools that were there to help maladjusted children. Several times he violently attacked teachers and pupils. There was an incident where they went on a swimming outing and he tried to drown some of the fellow pupils. Even his own family cut off ties with him and he literally had nobody he could rely on. When Erskine was actually arrested, the police when questioning him, they realised he practised Rastafarianism. I don't know if that's the right word but you see what I'm trying to say. And even those in the Rastafari world, they shunned him due to his burglary tendencies. Now little is known in his early life but it seems like he hung out with a lot of homeless people and because he was so off the grid the police just couldn't tie any possessions to him no house no phone no car like generally speaking if i i haven't been in america long i've only been here for five years if you could still tie a car to me you could tie a mobile phone record at least you understand what i'm saying but in the case of uh, Erskine, he literally had nothing. No one has been able to penetrate the mind of Erskine due to his disturbed state which worsened to the extent that he went to Broadmoor Secure Hospital and had been informed he will die in prison. Now many psychiatrists have tried to understand the mind of Erskine, they say his mind was that of an 11 year old, however there was an incident when he went to Broadmoor. Now Broadmoor uh, State Prison, State Hospital, whatever you want to call it in England, it also housed the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe. And there was an incident where another criminal, Paul Wilson, attacked Peter Sutcliffe. However, Erskine had the presence of mind to hold Wilson back. And to psychiatrists, this suggested, well, perhaps he does have a sense of right and wrong. Now, generally speaking, whenever I conclude in one of my videos, I try and understand the mentality of the killer and his family abandoning him as a kid obviously played a big role in the way he turned out as we are products of our environment. However, the question is why was he abandoned in the first place? Now I've run a little bit of research and the only conclusion I can come to is I have absolutely no idea. Like some of his actions were pretty peculiar. Picture this, on some of the victims after he killed them, he would fold their arms up and then tuck them in neatly into bed as if you know, he's tucking his son into bed or, you know, he's tucking me into bed. And maybe, maybe this is far-fetched and I'm not a professional, but maybe he's trying to make up for the things in his childhood that he missed out on or the fact that he can't maintain relationships. He is subconsciously carrying out what he'd like happen to him minus the killing. Yes, I know it's stupid and told you I'm not qualified as you can quite clearly tell. But I always try to understand the mind of a killer. The mind of a killer is fascinating to me as it is to you because we can't comprehend how you can go from that normal state of this is wrong to just snapping and then killing someone. Taking a life is probably the biggest sin one can commit in this world. But that is the story of Mr. Erskine. Why don't you guys comment, tell me what you think. What do you think of this new format, me talking to you directly? I quite enjoy doing it and I probably will keep doing it in the future. Thank you all for watching.